Okay, so our next speaker is um, Bruno, who is uh, here in Alzo. So, just one moment, please. All right. Hello, everyone. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about deep learning and spectroscopy. It's more mainly an, uh, a work which applies a bunch of machine learning methods to sort of try and see if we can predict spectra directly from uh, structures of molecules. Uh, I'd also like to thank my funding bodies and then the science infra infrastructure in Finland. And so a brief introduction uh, about spectroscopy. So usually what is done uh, is you have um, in experiment, you have some spectra, which is first sort of figured out. And then from the spectra, you try to um, infer the properties of molecules from the various shapes in the spectra, right? Um, this is typically done in expensive um, infrastructure where you'd have to apply for time. And then it also costs a lot of money. Um, and this needs to be done for one system at a time. Uh, to alleviate this problem, uh, brilliant scientists have been working on um, solving the same problem using quantum mechanics. So you have the Schrodinger's equation and then a bunch of practical approximations of it can be used to sort of directly go predict the spectra given a molecular structure. But again, it kind of has few of the problems as experimental spectroscopy. Uh, specifically, it can be time consuming if you now need to apply for computer time. And also it needs to be done one by one. And this is now an image of the Mahdi supercomputer in Finland. Uh, just so that everybody can see a picture of how it looks like. Anyways, so uh, to put it back into the sort of the schematic that I had presented before. So the theoretical or the computational spectroscopy now happens this way. So you have the structure and then you compute the spectra. What we wanted to do was to sort of bypass this and uh, figure out if we could use neural networks to sort of go directly from structure to spectra. And then, um, of course, now the other um, challenge exists, whether you could go from spectra back to st structure or properties or not, but that has not been discussed here. So we just focus on this part. So we go from structure to spectra. And to compute that, you'd need input output pairs. It's a supervised problem um, to compute uh, the input output pairs. You would still need to compute, do some computations, but that is the process that we assume that has happened before. So this is now the glorious li list of uh, collaborators who helped in this work. Uh, I would like to thank Annika, who did most of the heavy lifting with respect to the computations, and Milica, Milica and Patrick for sitting through uh, my questions about how these things work in practice. All right, so now in any machine learning set, uh, setup, in this case, a deep learning setup, you have a bunch of steps that you need to follow. So you need, of course, have the problem that you want to solve. Um, you start with uh, your data. In this case, it's the XYZ representation of molecules. And then you would want to compute a representation of the data that you want to feed into your machine learning model. Then comes the tricky part, which is here, which is basically uh, 
in colloquial speak, uh, grad grad student is grad student descent. So basically, you throw a master student or a PhD student at it, and then after a couple of months, hopefully you have a reasonably well performing neural network. You do some checks on it to see if the method works uh, to your liking or not, and then you could do at this point do one of two things. You could um, design a better neural network or tune the hyperparameters or collect more data and then repeat. And then at some point it's good enough for your prediction task. So let's look at what the input data, uh, let's look at the input data that we used for our models. Uh, so we, we used two different data sets. We used a data set of 134,000 uh, organic molecules, which is typically used for drug design. Um, and then we used a smaller data set uh, of a similar structure. Uh, the reason why we had a large and a small data set was to sort of check whether these models can perform with smaller data sets also or not. Right, so for our experiments, what we wanted to do was to predict the spectra, but as an intermediate step, uh, we decided to first check if we could predict the energy levels of the molecules or not. So all of these energy levels were computed with FHI aims and with the following structure relaxations. And then to get the spectra, we Gaussian broadened these um, delta functions and then added them up to get the spectra. So first we will look at the results of pre predicting these energy levels, right? So then to do that, you need to sort of represent the molecules uh, in a way that can be fed into the neural networks. Uh, one, very common way uh, is to use the Coulomb matrix. Now, this is a matrix-based representation of molecules um, where on the diagonal elements, you have this uh, fitted version of the atomic charges. And then on the off-diagonal elements, you have a product of the atomic charges and inverse of the distance. So if you have molecules, which uh, atoms which are close together, then this interaction is higher. And if they're further away, then this value is lower. This is what a Coulomb matrix looks like. Um, so that it's symmetric. And on the diagonal, you have the interactions that we spoke about. Right, so a common way to sort of start any of this is to get a baseline result um, to compare more complicated models against. A uh, very common starting point is to use a multi-layer perceptron. So you could use just a few fully connected layers, pass in the Coulomb matrix. Although I must say there's a lot more, you cannot, if you just pass in the Coulomb matrix as is, it will not work. Uh, if somebody is interested to know what else we had to do to the Coulomb matrix, uh, you can ask and then I, we can go into a bit more detail. Um, so once you do that, um, then you do the typical thing of figuring out how many layers you need, what size of um, layers you need, um, and then all of the hyperparameter optimization that was done with patient optimization. Um, and for this and all of the other models. And then the network was trained, right? So uh, after doing the optimize, hyperparameter optimization, we settled on two hidden layers with 250 neurons for the smaller data set. And this is the result we got. So basically what you see here is on the x-axis, you have the HOMO energy levels. Uh, so leftmost is HOMO and rightmost is HOMO minus 15. And on the y-axis, you see the mean absolute error in the energy predictions. Um, Sorry, what's the scale? 
uh, electron volts, media yeah, electron volts? It's in electron volts, yes. Electron volts, okay. Yes. Like. Yeah. Um, so you see that it kind of predicts well uh, in the center, uh, not so well on the sides. This seems to be an artifact in the sense that we could not figure out why it would not perform better on the sides, but uh, middle. Um, if you now go on to a more complicated uh, model, all, all those CNNs are not super complicated, but basically what we thought of was Coulomb matrices, matrices are square, they kind of resemble images. Um, can we figure out, um, can we use CNNs to sort of extract some features out of it? Again, um, you, you would not want to feed in Coulomb matrices as is, you'd want to apply some transformations on top. And then um, you, we used three um, blocks of convolutions, uh, each with three layers um, and three by three filters. And at the end, we, we flattened it, had a fully, fully connected layer, and then got the prediction out. With the CNN, you see the performance is about the same. But all of these are with smaller data sets. What if you increase the data set size, right? So of course, now, once you increase the data set size, you need to optimize the hyperparameters again. But we stuck to the same uh, set number of filters and then uh, the filter size. And this is the result that we got. So now again, the predictions are a lot more better. It's sort of uh, doesn't have this weird um, dip in between, although it still exists. Um, the other thing that we tried was uh, Christoph's uh, DTNN. It was new at the time, and um, it's always a good idea to sort of use learned representations. And um, this was um, learning the representation of atoms in its uh, surrounding. Um, and it has an iterative structure, which allows you to sort of uh, look at pairs of atoms and also angles uh, implicitly, which um, we thought was useful in this case. So this is the DTNN cartoon. Um, it's actually quite nice to look at the DTNN. So if, and I have a bunch of other slides if somebody wants to take a look at those. Uh, because there are certain features of DTNN which allow it to um, learn from smaller data sets as well as larger ones. And then um, knowing those features of the network helps. Uh, so then we used, these were the specific hyperparameters that we had. So we used uh, representations of um, atomic types. So each atom type has a specific encoding vector, and that was of length 30. Uh, we ran through the DTNN. Each um, sort of section of the DTNN output a spectra that we added up, and then we projected to the final uh, output size. And then with the DTNN, the results were slightly better. Right, so now that we are able to predict the energy levels reasonably well. The next task was to learn some spectra. Uh, so just to recap, we computed the spectra by Gaussian broadening these energy levels. Um, the sigma, I don't remember right now, but then it was again, sort of a hyperparameter that was learned. Uh, and then it was discretized in 300 points between minus 30 and zero EV. And um, so the output, all of these, um, these yellow dots on the right, these are of 300 dimensions from now onwards. All right, so now if we look at uh, error distributions of when using CNN versus DTNN for the 134,000 data set, you see that the DTNN 
does much better. So it's the, the error curve is narrower. I must point out this error on the x-axis is now the percentage error of the predicted when compared to the target uh, spectra. So basically how much um, does the predicted spectra differ from the target one? So the, uh, the error is in percentage at the bottom. So now you have, uh, you see the best predictions of, this, of the CNN. Um, it seems to have <laughs> all of the, the features of the, of the spectra in the sense that there are some shoulders here, which it captures well. But if you now look at uh, the average prediction, it's, of course, now doesn't capture nearly as many features as you'd want. So all of these peaks are averaged out. It still captures the dips here. Um, but yeah, overall, there are some problems with this uh, CNN as well. Uh, if you use the deep tensor neural network, uh, it captures the shoulder a bit better, not much, uh, but it still cannot, doesn't capture the, the double peaks. Um, but in the worst case, um, the DTNN is still able to capture most of the structure in the spectra. Um, so the number of peaks are correctly identified. Um, in the worst case, but of course now the, the valleys are kind of shifted a little bit. So for the convolutional neural network and the deep tensor neural network, 434,000, um, the average uh, error is now 0.231 EV and then deep tensor neural network was 0.18. And then the average error in the spectra was around 3% for DTN and then for, for convolutional neural networks. And then, but then all of this is fine. Um, the next task was, can we actually use this for doing anything interesting? So what we decided to do then was uh, we picked a new data set and then we wanted to see if we could figure out um, regions, we can figure, if you could figure out molecules from this data set, which have um, peaks in uh, different regions of the spectra, which might be useful. So these don't have DFT calculations. So we just make spectra predictions on top of these. So what we then do here uh, is we make spectra predictions for all of them and then we bin uh, the spectra and then count how many molecules had a peak or some intensity in the regions uh, that was mentioned on the x-axis. And then there we noticed that if you sort of leave out some uh, baseline because almost everyone, almost every, every molecule would have some intensity um, in this region, um, you would see that there's a peak here. And then these mo molecules could be then potentially interesting. Um, so this, this is something that you could use in, for sort of doing a quick scan through a large data set. Um, but because of the obvious defects, I wouldn't sort of use it for doing anything more. Um, yeah, and then on an average, uh, this is the spectra prediction of the data set. But that was basically it. Uh, the code exists now on GitHub. You could try to make spectra predictions of your own. And then uh, it is set up so that it's fairly straightforward to sort of download the model, uh, feed in your XYZ files, and then you'll get some spectra out. And if you have any further questions, I can take, I can take them now. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question here from uh, Lorenzo, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have actually two questions. Yeah. Um, one is, uh, if you can get, if you can go back a bit in, in, in your presentation. Um, well, 
I, I will ask only one because I forgot the second. <laughs> um, uh, my, my question is actually a bit philosophical, if you want. Um, if I understood well, you train your, your machine learning uh, on, um, on um, PBE uh, data. So uh, basically the, the energies and the spectra are those coming from uh, PBE calculations. Yeah. Um, so they are in any case far from uh, pretty far from what you would measure. So yes. what? So in my in, in my opinion, wh when you do something like this, when you have a PBE spectrum, let's say, what you're interested in is not in the spectrum itself, but the fact that you have all the passages in between, and so you can make analysis on what are the independent particles transitions involved in one peak or in the other. While when you pass through uh, 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 tensor, uh, let's say an approach like yours, you st you lose all the information in between. So at the end, you end up with the spectrum, which is not uh, not comparable with the experiments, and you have no other information than this fake spectrum. So what is the in, in, the, the the meaning of doing all this. I mean, uh, uh, despite I, I would not <laughs> to be too rude, but uh, yeah, I mean. So the question is basically, what is the use of this if you cannot capture the the peaks, right? Uh, but but even if you can catch catch the peaks, because when you catch the peaks, well, in any case, they they cannot uh, they cannot be compared with experiments. So what is the kind of information you get? You have just a spectrum that is. Well, it, it it is a spectrum, but with no 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 link to 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 any experimental value and no possibility to for you to do any analysis on it because because machine learning not, your neural network cannot give you the ability the the, the possibility to 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 make some analysis out of it. Okay, so. I would like to first thank the question because then that is, uh, but I would also like to point out that um, I'm not probably well qualified to answer that philosophical question. All I can do is sort of tell um, what was the idea behind doing this work. Uh, so the idea was basically to see if we can make spectra predictions directly from the uh, structure or not. So, of course, now these spectra predictions are we need to sort of use something as reference. Um, this is what the, the PB spectra was something that we use. Uh, now, would you want to use the spectra for doing anything meaningful or not? That's a different question. Uh, what we want to do now next is use more um, like fine grained um, energy. Uh, levels and then uh, spectra computed from that. So the GW spectra, so the higher fidelity one, and then the challenge with, and I'm not sure again, if that would uh, be helpful because then I think that is also not quite close to the experimental spectrum. But again, I'm not an expert in that. So we want to go there. Now, this was just a step in the process of getting there. So we wanted to show that, okay, you can make spectra predictions. Uh, with neural networks. Um, the next step would then be to sort of, we have already kind of done that with this, but that if you have a smaller data set, you can make spectra, like energy level predictions as well. It is not very useful if you want to go now to GW uh, energy levels and spectra, because then um, we don't have that many computations of those to train the neural network on. And even if we then want to, compute more uh, GW uh, calculations. We do not know which molecules to sort of compute those GW values of. Um, so the next thing that we want to do is then um, do this sort of active learning thing that we're already working on to sort of figure out, okay, uh, if you now want a larger data set of GW comp computations, which ones, um, which molecule should we compute of in addition to the data set that we already have. So I know that I did not answer your question, but this is the answer that I have. 
Yeah, but uh, anyway, I I would like to to be clear on. I, I really appreciate the work, and uh, and it's very good to know if you can do it. Just important also to to ask ourselves: it what is the limits and the the uh, the usefulness of what? We, but it, it is important when 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 you develop a technology to see if you can do something, just to see if you can do it. Exactly. So, so uh, I, I'm. I'm not. I'm not criticizing. By the way, I I remember my second question. If I can, I can. I would like to ask it. Otherwise, uh, I, I leave the. Lorenzo, yes. Can I just uh, before your second question? Can I comment also on this? Yes. Yeah, because I well, I perfectly understand your um, your uh, your point of view, uh, like playing the devil's advocate. No, for um, for the other side. Exactly. And, and you're right. Yeah, and you're right in the analysis um, thing. But um, uh, in how I see this thing is indeed, as uh, Kunal already said, this is a machinery that now we know it works. So if we have, for example, better Salpeter result, uh, this would give a much better uh, uh, prediction. We don't have so many, uh, so many um, uh, results to train. We don't have the 100,000 um, uh, better Salpeter result for these molecules. Um, but there is another things, for example, that you uh, shown when you had the, 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 um, the prediction in which there was highlighted um, a zone in which there were fewer molecules. So already there, there could be something. Let's suppose that you want to know more or less uh, if there are structures, molecules that have absorption, for example, in a certain uh, in a certain regions in frequency, and you don't want to, or you cannot try them all. With this machine learning, you know more or less where to start off. Yeah, yeah. This is, and, yeah, this is right. I agree. And then, of course, uh, then you do the, the, the calculation yourself, uh, maybe even uh, with, with beyond the uh, DFT PBE, uh, only on those molecules that have been already screened out. So I think the machinery uh, works quite okay. Of course, this. Uh, oh, that, still... that is something that we are working on. Yeah, yeah, okay. That... We're not proud of that. Yeah, no, no, but I, I agree. I, I, I have been too rude in asking my question, but they, no, 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 that's perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah, I'll also add. I think I agree. Um, yeah, exactly what Francesco is saying. In that, of course, you've learned here. To what extent can you get a spectra at all mm -hmm. out of the the the, the encoded um, molecules that you have? Right. Which is obviously the first thing you do because you don't collect all of this experimental data to find out the information is somehow not recoverable yeah. from the from the base components. But then also here, can you uh, use your results to get an idea of how much data would be required? Like Francesca said, if we had lots of data um, calculations, this could be more accurate. Yeah. You could inform how many more do we need because you could get your very large data set that you have and then make it increasingly small and to see at what point it breaks down. Yes. So okay, this amount, this small value is how many we would need of experimental or GW beta sulfita to get the improved result. And I think it'd be the same. The amount of data required for this will be the same as the experiment. There's no reason to think right. we, What we're doing now is the other way around. So we start with a small data set and then sort of add more yeah. to it and then and then see, okay, at what point is the accuracy good enough? Yeah. And that was uh, the dactyl active learning thing that I spoke about. So yeah, I think that that's the next step for it, sure. Okay. Uh, and, and my second question was about the uh, um, the intensity of your spectra. If I understood well, you just apply uh, um, some Gaussian broadening on the lines, uh, on, on, on the levels uh, that have been predicted before. But so I don't understand how you can have uh, more intense peaks. And so it's just the, how you get the, the, the matrix elements of the transitions, let's say. Ah, so you mean like, how does it go from here to this kind of a peak effect? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You basically add the intensity uh, of the Gaussian. So let's say if you have this. Uh, ah. Okay. Okay. So for each peak, you have a different intensity in the Gaussian. Yes. Ah. Okay. The peak just tell you where to put it, but then you don't have. A, okay. Okay. The height of the, the of each Gaussian is different. No. 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 So uh, the height of each Gaussian is the same, but then okay. uh, when you add them together, so basically. Now you go grid point by oh, grid okay. point and then add them up. So th at this point, uh, if you see my cursor, then this would be like added up and then there would be like a 
value here. And then at this point, these two peaks will kind of merge to get like a higher peak here. Okay, so so basically in, in this in this approach, you don't have any, uh, you don't include the physics of the uh, matrix element, the dipole moment transition, let's say the, the, the dipole transition, you don't, you don't put the, the call it uh, <laughs> other names of this is the uh, oscillator strength. Yeah, no, of it's, its just, it's just this, yeah. And would, wouldn't be a good idea to put it in, in your model? Um, it probably would be, but then I think uh, from, if you just look at it as a date, like an input and output representation, it would just be, and pardon me using like this terminology, but it would just be another squiggly line. So, so uh, for the neural network, it probably doesn't make any difference uh, how, what sort of uh, output it is. But I think it would be a lot more feature rich now in the sense there would be a lot more peaks and valleys um, if we now include uh, the matrix elements as well. So the fact I think first we need to sort of be able to get better at predicting these uh, peaks and valleys in general. Yeah, because one of the take home message of the talks of yesterday were the more physics you put in your model, the better it is. So correct. <laughs> this is like absolutely no physics and then you just use it as a pure prediction uh, model. Okay, thanks. I, I will stop monopolizing the debate. <laughs> I see there's another question from Asim uh, in the chat and it says, do you have any guess about the if the spectra prediction is particularly bad for certain kind of molecules? Um, I think there are more of these uh, peaks and valleys when there are heavier uh, atoms in the molecule. So that might be one, uh, but I we didn't do any further analysis on which ones is, is it good for and which ones is it not. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have a question um, from Mikhail, um, if you'd like to go ahead. Um, so thank you for the, um, for the talk and also the upcoming discussion. So some so basically, most of my question was already covered, um, but still, if I mean, maybe it's a naive question. So the, I mean, it was like it was mentioned, we need more physics to improve the model here. Um, so, but still, um, some part of the problem should be um, already tackled, uh, obviously in a very poor level, because like just the um approach here with pb we don't have included something like excitons or like the transition matrix which was discussed um but like from a naive point of view um if we um, would one need less data if one adds like more of this information based on the things the machine already learned in this first process or is it a rough way of uh, this type of thinking uh, sorry could you repeat again i didn't understand what your question is um, so like, um, so obviously the machine learned now some, some basic uh, things to cover doing this uh, simple PBE data. And um, as it was discussed, uh, we need more physics to, to cover all these features. So I just wonder, um, like from a naive point of view, um, based of the whole information you already gathered, would yeah. be then the in, like information of data, like of these more complex um, calculations then lower based of the things the machine already can capture from this input you gave them. Okay, I, are you referring to the fact that now, uh, can this be used to sort of figure out which um, other molecules to now add to the training set to sort of improve the prediction accuracy? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, I mean, uh, if that's the question then, um, Yes, to some extent, but I think uh, this model might not be the best for doing that. Okay. Like you could use sort of say that no, because then for the, the what this model would then do is uh, it would give you a prediction, and then um, you would still need to figure out okay, for this molecule, the prediction is bad, but then the only way you know that the prediction is bad is if you have the reference computation. So uh, this model per se will not be useful for that, but you could use another kind of model for sort of getting some uncertainty on the predictions. And then once you do that, 
then you could sort of figure out, use that to sort of add back to the training set and hopefully have improving models. Okay, so in the end, you kind of would assume that it would be uh, comparable efficient, like, for example, if you add these um, transition matrix elements to start from scratch, then from this model, right? Um, if you get now, like, a more, like, feature-rich reference computation, so I would guess you would have to start from scratch, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks for the. Okay, do we have any further questions? I have a question. Yes. It's more a uh, curiosity. Why not aiming for Raman spectra instead of electronic transitions? See, given that Raman is more related to the structure itself. Mm, I do not have a very good answer for that. I mean, uh, we just started with something like. We just picked one uh, spectra that sort of was readily available, mm -hmm. and then we just started training on that. So this was more like a pragmatic thing that okay, we now have the spectra, we have the data set, can we train a machine learning model on top of it? We and expect, uh, intuitively expect it to be more difficult, yeah. right? So maybe you start with the more difficult one and assume it can be easier. Okay, sure. Okay, so let's uh, thank Kunal again. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah.